Hi, this is my video about uh, the tree of life and a unified theory. Is this my theory about how the ancients had super technology based on uh, sacred geometry? But I found this this photo on my friend's blog. Uh, her name's uh, Carrie, but yeah, check out the video. And this is basically uh, showing all the correlations that all the ancient sites had uh, the tree of life as some kind of unified field theory and uh, yeah. But I knew it had to be two isotropic vector metrics. I didn't know what to do with these other spaces, these other tetrahedrons in the middle, neither. I got to make this become a sphere. But I don't want to distort the geometry of the isotropic vector metric. It has to be tetrahedron. So I'm like getting all frustrated about it. And I'm, okay, well, finally, I decided, okay, and I, I pushed one into the other. And I, you know, generated this in my brain. I was pushing one into the other and trying to figure out where the tetrahedrons would fall. And then that's when I realized what had happened. When you push one isotropic vector metric into the other so that you generate a perfect sphere, then the central geometry is a vector equilibrium, the only geometry in full equilibrium in all vectorial possibility. And there is no distortion because those four tetrahedrons that were in the isotropic vector matrix alone were there to accept the reverse one so that the one isotropic vector metric was missing its better half. And when the two came together, it created equilibrium. I still get the chills from that time when I discovered this. It was like, oh my God, 
this is beautifully, metaphorically, and beautiful for what I'm trying to achieve the geometry of equilibria and the geometry of the vacuum. And I could see how the male and the females coming together generates a new point of center, a new being. And I, I realized that the vector equilibrium had to be fundamental to the structure of space, of the class. Why is the vector equilibrium the only geometry in full equilibrium in all vectorial possibilities? Let me show you. If you have a vector going in one direction, and that vector has a certain length, we'll call the length of the vector its force. So longer it is, stronger it is, shorter it is, weaker it is, okay? In order to get equilibrium, you would have to have a vector in the exact opposite direction with exactly the same length. But that's a weak equilibrium because you'd have to nail that, uh, that vector so that it would be a perfect alignment here. Otherwise, you would miss equilibrium. And any forces pushing down in any other direction would break the equilibrium. It's very precarious. So how would you increase stability? You'd probably add vectors at 90 degree angle from those. Now you increase equilibrium, right? However, the edge of your geometry has longer vectors than the vectors to the center. Because they're longer, they're stronger, and thus your geometry explodes. It doesn't work. What would you do to try to correct it? Probably add vectors at 45 degree angles from these other ones. But if you did that, then the edge vectors are shorter than the vectors to the center. The geometry implodes. You still don't have equilibrium. <laughs> so what's the solution? The solution is the hexagon because the hexagon has edge vectors that the are the exact same length as the vectors to the center. It's the only geometry that does that. So now you have equilibrium. And what does that look like in 3D? It looks like a vector equilibrium, this geometry here. vector equilibrium. It's eight tetrahedrons pointing inward. <laughs> now, this can be seen as well as four hexagons intersecting each other. You see that? The red one on the edge, there's, there's a blue one at the equator, and then two ones intersecting in the middle. Everybody see that? Say that again. There's a red one on the edge, an hexagon on the edge. Four, I'm sorry, four hexagons intersecting, creating equilibrium at the center of singularity. And note that there is 12 vectors radiating from the vector equilibrium. So there's 12 vectors radiating from the center, and there's 12 edge vectors, 24 vectors. These numbers are found in most, most ancient civilization texts. 12, 24, and so on are found everywhere. The 12 angels with singularity in the middle, the 12 ap apostles, um, with um, with Emmanuel in the middle, the singularity, um, you know, and so on. The 24 elders in Kabbalistic tradition, and so on. So I was really amazed that I had found this, but my geometry was still out of equilibrium. 
Meaning, on the geometry of the two isotropic vector matrix, the vector equilibrium in the middle had all of its octahedron filled. That means that when the vector equilibrium is in the middle, the pyramidal structures are completed with octahedron. But the edge octahedron were incomplete. So I still had a symmetry. So, so I went back to the drawing board, back in my van, trying to, you know, I'm, I've got this in my brain, and I'm noticing that some of the faces on, of the octahedron are not covered. So it's asymmetric. So I decided I have to keep adding tetrahedron till I gain symmetry. So I kept on adding tetrahedron, and to cover all of the faces, I had to add 24 tetrahedron to the ones that were already there. So this is one isotropic vector matrix is 20. The other one is 20, that's 40, plus 24. 40 plus 24 was 64 tetrahedron metric. The 64 tetrahedron metric is a match to many, many things. I'm going to give you a hint. There is 64 codons that generate the 20 amino acids of your DNA structure. Okay? Now, uh, when I found the 64 tetrahedron grid, then I realized that that was the quanta in which symmetry was present everywhere and equilibrium was truly generated at the center. But g what got me really excited is that I realized what I had built. What I had built was a fractal structure, just like the 2D fractal structure I showed you at the beginning, but this one in full 3D uh, spherical corner. The only true fractal 3D spherical coordinate that you will find. Can everybody see the vector equilibrium on the inside and then the vector equilibrium on the outside? This continues to grow to infinity. And I could see that the inside vector equilibrium its radius is exactly half the radius of the one on the outside. So the geometry grows in fractals, but not only does it grow in fractals, the fractals are perfect octaves. You see? And so I got really excited. It's like, oh my God, here it is. The structure of the vacuum, equilibrium, to infinity, infinitely big to infinitely small. And then I noticed further that how this was constructed is constructed this way. Let me see if I can let go of some of the stuff. Actually, I'm gonna leave that. I realized what I had built. I had built a matrix based on eight star tetrahedron, each having eight tetrahedron in it, okay? All coming together towards the center to generate the star, uh, the 64 tetrahedron grid. But when it did, the eight stars coming together, okay, here you're only gonna see six, plus the one in front, and then there's one in the back you won't see. So the eight stars coming together generate the vector equilibrium in the middle. Why is this significant? Eight star tetrahedron 
is made out of eight tetrahedrons pointing outward, radiation, coming together to generate the vector equilibrium, which is eight tetrahedrons coming towards the center, generating contraction. So now, not only did I have found the geometry of equilibrium, but I had found the only fractal 3D metric, and it generated expansion and contraction. Exactly all the axioms I had placed for myself when I started this investigation of the geometry of space. <laughs> I was so excited. In a, in a pit. I'm still excited. <laughs> I yeah, I was doing this in my brain. I didn't have a computer, and I confirmed it later on computer. But I was like, oh my god, this is so awesome. And then something really weird happened. I knew I had the fundamental structure of space. I knew, you know, I was definitely seeing, now realize you guys, if we truly have the fundamental structure of creation, then technology that's based on this information is gonna tap directly into an infinite potential of energy, infinite potential of gravity, infinite potential of rejuvenation, regeneration, and so on. You're talking serious change in our way of doing technology.
Okay? Everything in nature has three dimensions. Most of our science is really dealing with two dimensions, and most of our tools are as well. So you can see the spiral here in the end. That's a pretty familiar spiral you see in your whirlpool. And that's easily understood, but it's two dimensions. It's this dimension and this dimension. But look, we've got a third dimension. And you can see it's changing in the third dimension. That's very complicated. I mean, it's infinitely complicated. If you think about it, every living thing goes through a liquid phase in its development. So it takes on the geometry of turbulence. So every living thing on Earth has these geometries built into it, from the cochlea of your ear to the spacing between your teeth, the size of your teeth, to even if I look at my finger, the length of that in proportion to that bone and in proportion to that bone are the same proportions that you find in these spirals. So it's everywhere.
having over 100 trillion cells in only 46 divisions. Binary sequences are also how computers work, by turning on and off chips. Computing at its core, anyways, is binary. Okay, let's move on to something different for now, but what we just looked at will reveal itself in time. This is how a polar graph usually looks, with 36 radial lines in 10 degree increments, representing the 360 degrees. Then, concentric circles are drawn, each with the same distance away as the last, creating eight equal demarcations as the one before, counting the inside circle as one. Think about what this represents too. It's a two-dimensional drawing of a three-dimensional sphere, one of the sacred forms, by projecting it onto a flat surface. This is also called a shadow form, and casting shadows is a sacred way to obtain information. Also, a polar graph has both straight, male lines, and circular, female lines, both male and female energies interacting at once. If you plot a golden mean spiral at zero degrees on the polar graph, it will loop all the way around before hitting zero again, exactly at the eighth circle. You'll find that this golden mean line crosses five specific places as it goes out. These places are where the female circular lines meet the male lines. It crosses at 120 degrees, 190 degrees, 240 degrees, 280 degrees, and then it jumps to 360 or back at zero, depending on how you look at it. What's interesting about this is that it creates both a binary and Fibonacci sequence. Looking at the radial increments from the center, it crosses at 1, 2, 3, 5, and 8. Well, that's Fibonacci, but it also crosses at 2, 4, and 8. Well, that's a binary sequence. We're going to look at the binary sequence in particular, though, because what you find is very cool. If you draw lines from the outermost circles on the lines where the binary sequence was formed, you get this image. It is an equilateral triangle. If you continue the spiral outward, it would continue to hit these exact same places and continue to form larger equilateral triangles. Let's divert yet again to look at something very interesting. There was a man named Keith Critchlow who discovered something very important to understanding the geometry of music. First, he drew a straight line through an equilateral triangle, and then he measured from the middle of the center line and drew a straight line up to the top edge and back down to the bottom corner. Then he did the same, but passed through the center line of the top and back down again. He did this yet again on the other side. You can keep doing this on either side as well. By drawing this funny little form, he discovered something of great importance. He writes, continuing in this way, each successive proportion will be the harmonic mean between the previous proportion and the total length, and all of these proportions will be musically significant. 1 over 2 being the octave, 2 over 3 being the fifth, 4 over 5 being the major third, 8 over 9 being the major tone or step, and 16 over 17 being the half tone or step. In other words, he discovered the geometries of music, or at least one aspect of them. Then he tried measuring it in a different way, starting at a different point of the center line. At three-fourths, he found the measurements were 1 over 7, 1 over 4, 2 over 5, 4 over 7, 8 over 11, and 16 over 19. All of these numbers are musically significant. This is very interesting. It means that the harmonics of music are somehow related to the proportions of the central line moving through a tetrahedron. Back to the polar graph, you can see that this drawing has a much greater value all of a sudden. Not only that, but it becomes even easier to make your measurements thanks to the polar graph itself. You can just draw a straight line through the drawing on the graph, and it will give you the center line. This information has been taken light years beyond what I just showed you though. A research team found that you can draw these lines not only from the center, but from any nodal points inside the upper half of the triangle, and you will come up with all known harmonics in existence. Basically, this means that anywhere the straight line and curve lines on the polar graph cross from 0 to 120 degrees and start making the pattern, you will come up with all known harmonic systems. Not only the western keyboard, but the eastern, and even many unknown systems that have never been used. As I'm not a musician, there's not much more I can show you related to this, but I would love to see what a musician could really do with this knowledge. How far could you take this? Alright, I'm running low on time here, so I'll wrap up with this unraveling. Remember when we talked about spirals in nature? They often travel in twos, usually this is male and female. So on this polar graph, if you're going to copy nature, you don't just plot one spiral, you have to plot two. When you do that, it gives you this image, which is a star tetrahedron inside of a sphere. We mentioned this in Lesson 7, and this image is more commonly known as the Star of David. Do you remember the face on Mars? NASA obviously tells us that it's just a random formation on the surface of the planet. But right next to the face, there are also a few pyramids and other anthropomorphic structures. I know what you're thinking, why on earth would I bring that up all of a sudden? Well, Richard Hoagland and his colleagues have spent a long time researching and deciphering a message on the surface of the red planet. Want to know what that message was? It was a star tetrahedron inscribed in a sphere. Holy balls, right? There's a link in the comments to a page with all of this information if you want to learn more. It's pretty crazy, and very eye-opening now that we have this information about what this really means. Inside the star tetrahedron, another one fits perfectly. We can continue to put more and more star tetrahedrons inside or outside of the other star tetrahedrons, the same way the golden mean spiral can wrap around the polar graph infinitely big or infinitely small. You'll notice that this smaller tetrahedron also happens to fit perfectly around this sphere. We'll check this out. If you put this same size sphere centered on the point of every single star tetrahedral point, guess what suddenly reveals itself? fruit 
of life. It's back. According to the Egyptians, as well as the Ascended Masters, this is one of the holiest, most sacred forms in existence. Of course, we already learned one of its informational systems in Lesson 6, and what you just saw was the second, only in reverse order. What this means is that all of the information of music, harmonics, sound, and spirals come out of this image. Not only that, but light and the dimensional levels work in the same way as harmonics, which we've already discussed in Lesson 2, 7, and 9, meaning that the geometric information about light and dimensions are also related to this star tetrahedron pattern. So just briefly looking at this image that we looked at in Lesson 7, this is the fourth unraveling of the Flower of Life. It is an infinite spectrum of never-ending fruits of life within more fruits of life. This is the unraveling of dimensions, so it makes a little more sense now, but I won't have time to show you anything more today. So what you just saw was the second unraveling from the third rotational pattern of Genesis, the geometry at the heart of creation.